Um, so it's been several years since King Dork first came out. Um, did you always have a sequel in mind? I always had an idea that the story would continue and that mm -hmm. those characters, that things would happen to those characters. Uh, I didn't know whether they would let me write a sequel or you know, publish a sequel. <laughs> Basically, you know, if you're if you're not if it's not going to be published, there's very little point in writing it. Yeah. So I wasn't sure whether how it would happen, when it would happen. Or um, or what form it would take, but yes, I th I've I've got a vague plan for these characters that takes them well into adulthood. So I don't know if that'll. <clears throat> we'll just see how yeah. much of that gets written. So what sort of like cosmically aligned for for now to be the time for the sequel to come well, come back? <clears throat> yeah, I wrote. I I mean, I wrote a second very um, uh, massively difficult and crazy novel after King Dork that was from coming from a completely different yeah. place and then uh, the aftermath of that uh, I didn't know what to do and then <laughs> I I had I knew that I was going to try to write King Dork approximately I knew the title and I knew that what it was I knew basically um, that it was going to pick up exactly where the other one left yeah. off, but a lot of writing for a lot of people, and, but maybe especially even me, uh, involves a lot of kind of fretting and mulling it mm -hmm. over, and the actual writing part of it goes very quick, but it's the working up to that mm -hmm. that takes a while, and I just had <laughs> a long working up to it part uh, on this for a variety of reasons, my, you know, my I don't know if like if you you have these the time when you're actually writing when it finally mm -hmm. bursts forth is a weird supernatural almost time yeah. and, if, and it, it, it's the sort of thing where once you finish doing it you can't believe you were the same person who did it before and <clears throat> those are great although they're cha physically challenging they damage your health mm -hmm. but that's how the books get written and if I could schedule those more close together and more regularly I would it would be much better for my <laughs> career, but I found that you just can't do that. It just mm -hmm. has to happen when it happens. So <clears throat> there were there was a there was a gap that was me, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, you know, self recrimination, a lot of mm -hmm. I can't do it, I can't do it, damn it. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> yelling at my cat, why, why? <clears throat> um, and uh, you know, in the end I finally managed to do it uh, and now I look back on it, I can't really believe that it happened. It was yeah. like a like a one month of just you sort of like black out and it's like all of a sudden you had a book. <laughs> yeah, it was almost like that. It was like this sort of frenzy. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I mean it, it it would be great if you could do it regularly, yeah. although it might kill you. <laughs> so there's that's the other thing. Um, yeah. Cause it would defeat the purpose if you wound up dead before <laughs> finishing. So uh, yeah. Okay. But <clears throat> it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so Tom in King Dork is always complaining about the catcher cult. Um, were, would you have considered yourself part of the catcher cult when you read it? Or no, not really. But I wasn't hostile to it. <laughs> not like I, Tom is. <laughs> no, and I and then I certainly didn't sort of see it as the the kernel of a grand universal conspiracy of evil. I mean, <clears throat> I the the. <laughs> the, the the only thing I would say about it was um, I read it like everyone else, and I I would go around saying how much I liked it like mm -hmm. everyone else, but I was faking it to a large degree. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned after I wrote King Dork, I heard from a lot of people who were faking it as well. I did feel that it, like with anything else, it is a little weird when you have a thing, anything as a book, a movie, anything at all, where everyone in the room you're in or everyone in the world you're in has the same opinion on it. That's a little bit strange and creepy and there's something screwy going on there, I think. So I did kind of feel that and I did feel that the devotion to it, the personal devotion to it was a, was a bit odd. But I didn't, that's the difference between me and Tom Henderson. I didn't care. 
I was like, yeah, whatever. I mean, he, he takes things. He takes very, it very personally yeah, that people very, are this obsessed with he takes it very catcher. Personally. I was more. I didn't care. So no, I wasn't. I wasn't in the catcher cult, but I didn't want to destroy the catcher cult. I just kind of let the catcher cult be happen around you. I looked askance at it, like I any kind of cult, yeah. I, any kind of. Uh, Thing. I wasn't a joiner. Yeah. Any group I didn't really particularly <laughs> like, and I kind of looked askance at it. Yeah. But that was, I, you know, sort of internally frowned at it mm -hmm. and hoped they didn't notice me. That was my strategy. Um, what do you think would happen if um, Tom Henderson ever met Holden Caulfield? <clears throat> you know, I bet. I, I think they would hate each other. I think they would recognize. <laughs> themselves in each yeah. other and uh, you know he would yeah I mean if someone has said I think I don't know if it was a review or a comment somewhere someone said you know that this is this is the book that that uh, Holden Caulfield would hate <laughs> <laughs> and I think they would you know I think you you they, I think they would rebel against each other um, and you know Holden uh, called Tom a phony <laughs> oh yeah that, well Tom is a phony I mean you know he, he well I mean I, I don't know if he is really he doesn't yeah. know the degree to which he is failing to grasp and deal yeah. with reality. Well, I think he's, he's he, what, 15? He, he hasn't, he hasn't had time to figure out if he's a phony or not. No, <laughs> he, he kids himself yeah. a lot. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's part of the fun of writing it. But that is yeah. like how how many of us are yeah. when uh, we are young and yes. even when we are old. Yeah. Um, so you're also a musician. Did you ever go through a phase similar to Tom where you routinely came up with new ideas for band names and album titles yeah, that definitely. never happened and definitely I mean that was <laughs> that's where that came from yeah. in the book that's one of the I mean, uh, people always ask how much of it is autobiographical mm -hmm. how much of you how much of me <clears throat> is Tom Henderson and, you know it's very little literally is yeah. but that is when I said there was that was all, yeah. I mean th th I didn't have that much to do in, in <laughs> high school I didn't play sports I didn't have friends. Mm -hmm. I I had a rich fantasy life, and it, a lot of it involved um, fantasies of being a rock star. And I did that exact yeah. thing, which I know lots of people do. Yeah. It's the logo, it's the name, it's the out first, second, third, fourth album. And I would think of I thought of them as notebook bands, um, and there were a lot of them. And <clears throat> some of the names wound up in King Dork, uh, okay. like the Underpants Machine and the Vising <laughs> Eye. That was the Vising Eye was probably my favorite one, um, but yeah, there were they, it was a it was a good time. And then I didn't have any. Tom has a partner in crime, Sam yeah. Hellerman. I didn't have that till much later. Although I did have, I, mean, I didn't have a partner in rock and roll crime. Yeah. But I did. I I did. That's another thing that kind of came from my experience that I had an alphabetical order friend, John Portnoy, <laughs> who was you know always. Uh, Always right next to me, yeah. after me, and um, <laughs> and that's how you that that's is how we knew each other. We were sort of friends, but I didn't have anyone to share the rock and roll with till much later. Yeah. So it was all in my head. Okay. Um, how does your I, I don't know I, I don't know if it's writing style or just kind of the way you approach writing. How is it different between writing music and writing your books? Are they are they similar? <clears throat> different? Similar in similar to a surprising degree in that. In both situations, it's like I said before, mm -hmm. how you're sort of trudging around, waiting for the uh, the action to happen, yeah. waiting for the inspiration to strike. I mean, that's you can try just like with with writing a novel, writing a song. You can kill yourself trying to make it happen, and if it's not, if the spark isn't there, it just doesn't happen. And so you can you just spin your wheels, and mm -hmm. it doesn't happen. So, uh, and as far as the um, approach. Not all novels are like this, but mine yeah. are. Um, it's basically, you know, you get into the mindset of this character, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a little corny to say, but you know, <laughs> like the character writes the song is what we would think, <laughs> say. Um, but it is kind of like that. Yeah. It's like you get yourself into the, um, and and all the every song that I have has, um, or at least I try to make it have a, a kind of core conceit that. It builds on in you know successive mm -hmm. layers, um, and it's 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 actually quite challenging to make that work perfectly in a two and a half minute song in a way that's satisfying, in a mm -hmm. way that makes sense, in a way that gets across what you're what you want to do. In a novel, um, there's a lot more room to stretch out, and you can do these things 
uh, uh, more you can you it's there's a lot of possibilities there to do that same mm -hmm. thing and to do many different conceits like simultaneously mm -hmm. crisscrossing and everything. On the other hand, the other challenge that you don't face with a song is you've got to hold people's attention for 300 pages, um, whereas a song is over in a minute and a half. If a if you do a song and people don't get it or don't grasp it or don't care about it or hate it, it's gone in two minutes and they don't they just get on with their lives. If you have so to speak, force them to go through 350 pages and they feel any of those things. Mm -hmm. They are very angry at you. It's like they take it very personally. You've mm -hmm. attacked them. You've destroyed. You've, I'll never get that. I'll never get that time back. So um, it, trying to make the same stuff that happens in a song happen in a novel, there, there are bigger challenges. When it works, it's great, though, because, you know, it's also you are... Um, uh, when people spend that much time with characters, they internalize the, them, and they get. And it's kind of it's kind of cool. I mean, I like the idea that people think of the characters as real people, mm -hmm. and that they 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 care about them. And that, that's a really great thing. But it's it's kind of challenging to do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, there's similarities, challenges, a lot of. You couldn't write a song like you write a novel, but you can write a novel like you write a song. I guess that's a best answer I have. Okay. Um, and then I have a series of uh, flash questions. Okay. So I'm not rapid good at fire. These, so <laughs> uh, they're, they're not that hard. Uh, favorite decade? 70s. Uh, private show, who's playing? Alive or dead, past or present? The who? Uh, French fries or tater tots? Tater tots. Avengers or Justice League? Avengers. Favorite Disney movie? <laughs> Uh, is Old Yeller a Disney movie? Yes. Old Yeller. Uh, beach or the Mountains? Mountains. And that's it. Wow, that was easy.